Just a few months ago, Moscow, Idaho meant nothing to me, and it might mean nothing to you, unless you've been following the case of the University of Idaho students who were found slain in their off-campus rental house back in November of 2022. Now, anytime I hear Moscow, Idaho, it's all I think about. The case from today happened in the very same place, Moscow, Idaho, to a mother of four who went missing in the spring of 2010. This is her story. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. Today's case is gonna be taking us to a place that has been in the media a lot lately, and that is Moscow, Idaho. If you're not familiar with the recent case of the University of Idaho students who were killed in their off-campus rental home, this case takes place in the exact same city. But before I get into it, let's thank our sponsor for today, and that is Flip. I've talked about the Flip app before on this channel, but it's been a little while, so here I am again, and I still have the same amount of excitement. I have told so many of my friends to download this app. Even my boyfriend John is on there, and it's a lot of fun. It is the best new beauty app. It's like TikTok for beauty, makeup, hair products, like this one that I used today. This is the Pineapple Swirl. And look how cool this app is. I can scroll all day long finding new products that I've never seen before and I never knew that I needed in my life. Flip is different from the traditional way that you buy beauty and wellness products. I am so busy. I do not have time to leave my house or to scour the entire internet for new things. Instead, I use Flip and let the products come to me. I'm always getting new things from Flip, especially things that I wanna try for the very first time because I trust the reviews from people like you and I. Flip lets you shop directly from honest TikTok style reviews from real users of these products. Every review on Flip is verified and authentic. Unlike some websites that use fake comments, we've seen them, and bots. If you already have an account, I'll leave my link below. Come follow me, I will follow you back, leave you some love on your reviews and also, Flip has an unrivaled beauty rewards program and you can get rewards even if you don't buy anything. You literally make money just by scrolling, shopping, voting, or even posting your own reviews. That's my favorite part. Earn rewards that save you up to 30% off on every purchase. There are products I use every single day, like this Hustic eyeliner that I got from Flip and I did a review for this one too. My latest haul included this Evercolor Poreless Face Defender by Mally. It's clear. I've never seen anything like it. And I had to get this glitter dust by Pretty Vulgar because it reminds me of when I was in high school and all the Victoria's Secret sprays had glitter in them. I haven't gotten anything from the Flip app that I did not love. So I 100% recommend that you try it out. Up your beauty shopping game with Flip and download the Flip app for free today or go to flip.shop slash Kimber and save 30% off your first order with code Kimber. I'll put it right here on the screen. Thanks again to Flip for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into the story for today. So as I was saying, this case today takes place in the same city that the University of Idaho students were murdered. What's interesting is I pre-planned this case way back into last year when I did another case with a victim of the exact same name as the woman I'm gonna introduce you to today, Rachel Anderson. You may recall that case. It was about Rachel Anderson, the funeral director. I'm gonna put the thumbnail right here. When I was researching that case, I came across this one for obvious reasons, same name, and I would get confused here and there when I was doing my research. So due to how intrigued I was with both of these cases, I posted the funeral director's case first, and I planned this one for a later time, which is now. I didn't want to confuse anyone with having two women back to back with the exact same name. However, I had totally forgotten that this case took place in Moscow, Idaho. As I was sitting down to research, I was blown away because before November 13th and the tragedy that happened to those four college students, Maddie Mogan, Kaylee Gonzalez, Ethan Chapin, and Dana Kernodal, I had never heard of Moscow, Idaho in my life. That tragedy really put the small city on the map and it wasn't for good reasons. That case involves Washington State as well. Since Washington and Idaho border each other, and this case is no different. It really helped that I was already familiar with this area due to the alleged killer of the Idaho students having lived in Pullman, Washington and traveled over the border into Moscow, Idaho to commit the murders. I figured this case from today would provide some more insight into what Moscow is like and how residents of both Washington and Idaho travel back and forth between the two states on a very regular basis. 
It's almost as though they are living in one state, especially those close to the border. So let's get into some of those facts now. We've established that Washington and Idaho are right next to each other, and those close to the border come in and out of each state and go back and forth quite regularly. The first area of interest will be a town called Clarkston in Washington. So I'll take you there before moving into how this is connected to Moscow. Clarkston, Washington is a small town that borders Idaho and is separated by the Snake River. The population back in 2010 when this case took place was only about 7,200 people. It's located in what's called the Lewis Clark Valley. That's where Clarkston gets its name from William Clarkston and Meriwether Lewis from the Lewis and Clark Expedition. It's the United States expedition to cross the newly acquired western portion of the country after the Louisiana Purchase. Now, something I found interesting was that these two states are so connected that they refer to this area as the Lewiston, Idaho, Washington, Metropolitan Statistical Area. They abbreviate it as MSA. And they actually combine the two counties, one in Idaho and one in Washington, and it encompasses five Washington communities and five Idaho communities, even adding up the population total and including all of that in the census. So combined, this area had a population of about 60,000 people in 2010. That's not something I see very often, combining populations of two different states. It's also the fourth smallest metropolitan area in the United States. Here are two bridges along US Route 95 that connect the two states in this area, the Southway Bridge and the Snake River Bridge. Rachel Anderson lived in Clarkston, Washington, specifically right here at 925 Third Street. She had a three bedroom, one bath, single family home it was so beautiful. It had original hardwood floors, a nice open kitchen. It was perfect for a little family. At the time, Rachel was a single mother of four. Two of her children were adults who had already moved out, and two were young boys living with her in Clarkston. But before I go any further, we need to go back to June 11th, 1969 in Belfouche, South Dakota. That's where Rachel Lee Anderson was born. Unfortunately, I couldn't find much as far as Rachel's childhood was concerned and piecing together her family tree was also a very daunting task. I know for sure she had two sisters, a younger sister, Christina, and an older sister, Crystal. She may have also had a brother, Robert, but it was really hard to tell, even pulling information together from Facebook, since it wasn't clear who her parents were. I was disappointed, since I'm very dedicated to knowing as much as possible about every person I talk about on this channel. However, there is still a lot to learn about Rachel. From what I could gather, it appears that her family made the move from South Dakota to Lewiston, Idaho, but not certain when this occurred. However, by 1986, when Rachel was only 17, she was welcoming her first daughter into the world, little Amber. And one year later, she gave birth to another daughter named Ashley. So before the age of 20, Rachel was already the mother of two beautiful baby girls. It isn't clear who she was married to at the time, but she was married a total of four times. Being close in age, I would assume that Ashley and Amber grew up side by side, forming a tight bond. It shows later in life when tragedy strikes this family. Rachel was a young, adventurous, fun-loving mom who doted on her two girls. They were her world. They had the best birthday parties. Rachel was an attentive mother. She went out of her way to devote her time to teaching her children everything she could. She was intelligent, strong-willed, but humble and kind. By 2009, at 39 years old, Rachel's two daughters were already adults. Amber was 23 and Ashley was 22 years old. They were no longer living under their mother's roof, but from the records I pulled, they were living close by, sometimes in Idaho and other times in Washington. What is clear is that they were both close enough to get to Rachel's house within a reasonable amount of time, and both girls were very close to their mother. All three could pass as sisters. And sometimes that's the case when a woman has children at a young age. I know my mom was always mistaken as my sister growing up. Sometimes people think that I'm my daughter's sister as well. Rachel had two sons, a five-year-old named Gavin and a nine-year-old named Aiden. She had been married and divorced three times as of 2009. Rachel was a petite, just over five foot brunette with pretty brown eyes who loved to laugh, smile, and she absolutely adored her family. She took her role as a mom very seriously. She was a dedicated mom who already raised her two daughters and gave them everything they could ever need to become outstanding women. She also took her job very seriously. She was a medical technician. As a single mom, her main goal was to provide a good life 
for her two young boys that were still under her roof. Rachel was known to be spunky and fun and able to make friends quickly. One of her best friends at the time was Susie Jepson, and they were friends from the day they met. There was just something magnetic about Rachel. And just looking at her smile alone, I just imagine her having a sweet demeanor. She was someone that you could count on, but there was something missing in Rachel's life, a man. It's true. She had already given it a go three times in the past, and those relationships just didn't work out for one reason or another. But she desired a companion, someone by her side to enjoy her life with. She had just dealt with a guy that she was dating in 2008, William Slump, who became obsessed with her. And this was after she tried to break it off. He would randomly send her letters asking if she was still interested. And this was months later. And she would tell him no, but the letters would not stop. There was also a neighbor that kept asking her out on dates, even though she said she wasn't interested. And being attractive, Rachel did get a fair share of guys laying it on thick, trying to get her attention. Rachel was definitely interested in the idea of finding Mr. Wright. And it happened in February of 2009. His name was Charles Capone. And yes, he shares the same last name as the notorious gangster Al Capone, but Charles was a Christian man. He really impressed Rachel. He would say blessings over their meals before they ate. He would make her laugh. And to her, he was very attractive. She was smitten. He was wholesome. He was the type of guy she could bring around her boys and not worry that he would be a bad influence. And they started going to church regularly together every Sunday. Charles also owned a successful auto repair shop called Palouse Multi Services in Moscow, Idaho. And there is that connection that I told you about. The couple would travel back and forth between Washington and Idaho to visit one another. Something Rachel really admired about Charles was his giving nature and how compassionate he was. He would actually service people's cars free of charge if they were unable to make their payments. He was very devoted to his small community and those who knew him respected Charles. That small community is Moscow, Idaho. It's about 40 minutes away from Clarkston and coincidentally, Charles's body shop is just a four minute drive from 1122 Kings Road, the address of the home where the University of Idaho students were killed in November of 2022. I'm showcasing this to illustrate what a small world it is, but more so to show you what a small town Moscow is. There was only about 23,000 residents living in this area in 2010, with the local student population making up over half of that number, so around 11,000 students, who come to the University of Idaho and reside in Moscow for that exact reason alone. It's known as a college town. The University of Idaho is only 1.2 miles away from the Washington border, and there's only a nine minute drive between the University of Idaho and the Washington State University. With the two schools being so close to one another, the two student populations mix and mingle with one another, whether it's attending sporting events like the Vandals football game in the University of Idaho's KV Dome or a Cougar football game at Washington University's Martin Stadium. Xana Kernodal, one of the University of Idaho victims, had a sister who attended the neighboring WSU, and they were very close, hanging out together all the time. Not to mention the nightlife. Bars like the Coog are frequented by both Idaho and Washington students. As a matter of fact, Kaylee Gonzalez, another one of the Idaho murder victims, was seen there on her 21st birthday. This was just on June 8th, 2022. It's no surprise because it's literally called a college bar. There's even really tasty coffee shops like Dutch Brothers, where Kaylee used to work. I'm pointing this out because there are so many connections between these two towns and so much overlap with the residents. When Rachel and Charles were in Washington on Rachel's side, there was a lot to do in Clarkson. Lots of fun activities for couples to do, like taking a tour of Basalt Cellars, which is an award-winning winery where they have handcrafted wine. It makes for a very romantic outing, or they could visit the Riverport Brewing Company. It's the perfect place to relax, listen to music, and enjoy a cold beverage. The one thing that isn't on the menu in Clarkston is violent crime. According to Crime Scout, violent crime in Clarkston is about 2.37 per thousand residents, meaning crime in the area is relatively low. Residents could raise their families in a safe environment. It was hard to believe that anything sinister could happen in this sleepy, quiet northwestern town. And now with Charles by Rachel's side, she felt even more at home and content and ready to take the next step. The pair were officially married by September that same year. That's just seven months after they met. It's definitely not uncommon when you're a little older, like in your late 30s or 40s, to just know when someone is right for you. They made a good team 
And as a matter of fact, it wasn't long before Rachel was helping Charles with his auto repair business. The office really needed a woman's touch, and Rachel was more than willing to help. She rearranged the office, making things way more organized and helping to run the business more efficiently, which helped Charles save money in just a two months time. It was great. Charles even made Rachel an official partner in his company. And it wasn't long before the couple decided to move in together. Rachel and the boys were already settled in Clarkston, so Charles decided to move in with them and it was really nice. They had somewhat of a father figure in the home now and Charles took the boys fishing for the first time and Rachel enjoyed hunting. So she would put on full camo and accompany Charles with his buddies on hunting trips. It was a lot of fun. But sometimes fun wears off. This happens and it's very disappointing. But it was as though the honeymoon phase was over. I'm not sure why Rachel's other relationships didn't last, but for her and Charles, there was trouble in paradise just two months after their wedding. By December of 2009, they had decided to split up. Was it forever? They didn't know. They just knew they were doing a lot more bickering than loving at the moment. And couples go through these rough patches sometimes, and sometimes they get back together, other times they don't, and they're better apart. Charles and Rachel still talked on a regular basis. Sometimes those conversations were great, and other times they just could not see eye to eye. However, she did end up confiding in him when she started to get strange phone calls. Out of nowhere, around the beginning of the year, these calls started to come in. But when Rachel picked up the phone, there was dead silence on the other line. Nothing. No one would respond, even when she asked who it was. But it didn't stop there. The calls progressed into music playing in the background, and it was muffled, and no one would speak on the other line. Then she started to get phone calls from various telephone numbers with these creepy disguised voices. And this is when it got really terrifying. The disguised voices would tell Rachel what she was doing, what specific lights were on in her home, as though they knew every move that she was making, like she was being watched. That's no joke. Enough was enough at this point. Rachel was scared. She told her friend Jennifer Norberg, that the caller would block their phone number. So Rachel couldn't tell where these calls were coming from. And she obviously didn't recognize the voice because it didn't even sound real. It was a very distorted, almost like a robot. And it's chilling. I have a few clips of this caller. They would leave messages on her voicemail box. So they're recorded. And I can play some of those clips now. I just had to call back. Uh, to know. I don't owe you anything. I, I don't feel guilty about it. But I, I don't owe you anything. Wow, that is weird. It's very weird. It's, it's as though these people want revenge of some kind. What's the most disturbing to Rachel is that this caller seems to be right outside her home and she has two young children inside. She didn't know what to expect or what this person would do. So far, things are escalating at a fast pace. So what would happen next? What's after phone calls? She didn't want to find out. She was asking everyone she knew, even her neighbors, if they were responsible for these calls. She figured it had to be someone that knew her. Someone who was always close by because they'd say things like, why aren't you home right now? Where'd you go? Or I just saw you turn off your bathroom light. And that's creepy. Well, then Charles starts getting the exact same phone calls, exactly the same with the silence on the other end, and then escalating into the weird, distorted voice threats. They're trying to think of who they could have annoyed or pissed off enough to play games like this. Was it a disgruntled customer? After a while, they were both taking it even more seriously, especially because other things were happening. It just didn't stop there. One afternoon, Rachel noticed the lock on her shed was broken. She knew she didn't break it. She knew the boys didn't break it. Then she heard something and she goes out on the porch one night. When she goes to see what's there, she just finds this bottle of men's cologne sitting on her porch. I found it strange. I, I kind of also found it funny for some reason, but it's not funny at all. This is serious. I just didn't understand why they would leave a bottle of men's cologne. What message are they trying to send? Does it even matter? The fact is someone was definitely stalking Rachel and it wouldn't be the first time, but it definitely was more serious than anything she experienced in the past. I wish I could say it came to an end, but it only got worse. Rachel did proactively reach out to law enforcement and she let them know that she was being harassed. She called the Asotan County Police Department in Clarkston, Washington, and she gave them all the details about what was going on. 
So they instructed her to continue to document any harassing messages that she received, any phone calls. But as I said, it only got worse. One night, she comes outside her house to find that someone has slashed the tires on her white Dodge Stratus sedan. This person wasn't going to stop. That was apparent. But it was frustrating because she didn't know who was doing this. It was before the days of having a ring camera. Unless someone were actually to see the person doing it, it was almost impossible to figure out who it was. This person knew where she lived. They would tell her what time she came home, where she was standing in her own house. She knew they weren't scared to harm her car. So what would they do next? What about her? Would they take the next step and harm her or her family? Charles found out about what happened and he told Rachel, you know what, I will take care of everything. I will give you new tires, complimentary, even though they were separate at the time. He had other cars on his lot that she could borrow as well, so she didn't have to worry herself with extra unexpected expenses or to not be able to drive her boys around for their activities. Again, Rachel's reaching out to the police department. And this time she told them she feared for her life. Multiple police reports were filed. They even assigned her a detective. His name was Captain Dan Halley. So she began checking in with him every single day, reporting that the calls were not stopping. Captain Halley reassured her they were going to figure out everything. They were going to get to the bottom of this. But get this. After the car was all fixed up, Rachel's at work one day. She comes out in the middle of broad daylight to find that someone has literally smashed in her back windshield of her car. Wow. How was this even possible without being seen? Rachel is extremely frightened. She shows up again at the police department, speaking to Captain Halley in person, explaining everything to him once again. All the calls that she was receiving and that Charles was getting to, the weird messages, the threats, somebody knowing her every move, her vandalized shed, and now her car two times. So Captain Halley asked Rachel if she had any idea who could be behind all this, and she says yes. She's confident it was that guy that she dated for a few weeks back in 2008. William Slump, the guy that wouldn't take no for an answer and kept sending her letter after letter. She thought that he had finally stepped up his game because he found out that she was with Charles. Captain Halley said this was really good information and he was going to look into it. This was in the beginning of April, but it had been going on since the beginning of January. After this, Captain Halley and Rachel exchanged a number of phone calls with Rachel inquiring as much as she could about the progress of her case. Meanwhile, the calls are still coming in. This stalking had compelled her to sleep in the living room of her home with the lights on instead of sleeping in her own bedroom. She wanted to be able to hear if someone came in her home. And many times, she would actually have a friend stay over because she was that scared. Rachel finally decided to apply for a restraining order against William. It was the week of April 11th. Rachel had an appointment to meet with Captain Halley on Friday the 16th to turn over all the information that she had gathered about William, along with all the documented harassment, all the recorded messages, the pictures of things that were broken or left behind, everything. But Rachel never made it to that appointment. It wasn't until Monday morning on April 19th that Rachel didn't show up for work that her family got very concerned. Her daughter Amber gets a phone call from St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center in the pathology lab. That's where Rachel is a medical technician. And they tell Amber that her mom never showed up for work that day. That was highly unusual, coupled with the fact that Amber knew her mom was in fear for her life. She's beside herself. She had told her mom to go stay at someone's house, get out of town, do something, don't just stay in this home. But Rachel refused to leave because of her children. Rachel had Aiden and Gavin, her 11 and six year old to tend to. They had school there. Their lives were rooted in Clarkson. So where was she supposed to go? And where was she now? Could she be at the boys' school? Well, it's where she wasn't that made Amber more concerned. The boys had been with their fathers that weekend, but Rachel was supposed to pick them up that Monday from school. She never showed up. That's when Amber knew she had to do something. There was just no way Rachel would have left her sons. She wouldn't do that. Rachel doesn't just have four children. She also had four grandchildren, ages five, four, two, and just 16 months old. She loved and cared deeply for those around her. If she left, Amber knew it wasn't on her own accord. And that scared her. First stop was Rachel's house. Amber called her boyfriend and told him to go over her sister Ashley's house right away to inform her of what was going on and then she sped off to her mom's. Ashley was home with her daughter when Amber's boyfriend knocks on the door to inform her that 
Rachel is missing and that Amber was headed over to Rachel's to look for her. Ashley quickly jumps in her car to meet Amber over there. And when she arrived, she was frantically asking Amber, what is going on? Where's mom? And Amber explained that she doesn't know. She didn't show up for work. She didn't pick up the boys. So they tried the front door, but it was locked. And their spare key did not work anymore because Rachel, being afraid for her life, recently changed her locks. Amber and Ashley considered breaking the door down, but they were scared of what they might find inside. If Amber and Ashley were to have discovered their mother's body, they didn't think they would ever be able to recover. They felt helpless. They just stood outside in the yard for so long, trying to figure out what to do next. They finally make the decision to call 911 and leave the task of investigating their mom's home to authorities. Amber also notified other family members, including Rachel's sisters, Crystal and Christina. Christina received a text that said, help, mom's missing. No one has heard from her since Friday. When officers got word about Rachel, they were in the middle of a briefing and a call came through about a missing person. And when Captain Halley heard the name Rachel Anderson, it sent chills down his spine. He felt a knot in his stomach. He immediately feared that something terrible could have happened to her. He had just seen her on Wednesday and knew she was supposed to meet him on Friday. However, she canceled that appointment with him. And now she's being reported missing. This is not a good sign. Hallie gave all of Rachel's information to one of the department's lead detectives, Jackie Nichols, and dispatched her to Rachel's home at 925 3rd Street. When she arrived, she saw several people in the front of Rachel's home, including Rachel's daughters, Amber and Ashley, who were freaking out. They could not get the information out fast enough. They were telling the detective everything they knew, every little detail, down to the fact that Rachel told Amber she thought that the harassment she was experiencing would ultimately end in her death. Can you imagine that those were the last words your mother said to you and now she's missing? Detective Nichols looks around the house on the outside trying to figure out if any windows are open or if she can get through any other doors and she finds a way inside through a back door. So she did not have to break into the residence and that's kind of alarming if it's that easy to get right into Rachel's home because when do you think it would be on lockdown considering how scared she was? So Amber and Ashley, they're just waiting. They're like holding their breath, hoping that their mom is not dead inside. But after a thorough walkthrough, Detective Nichols does not find anything noteworthy, no signs of a struggle, no blood, and no Rachel, and it's bittersweet. On one hand, their worst fear has not come true. Rachel wasn't found deceased, but on the other hand, she's truly missing. There were no bags that were packed or missing from the home. Rachel's toothbrush was still there in the bathroom. It didn't appear as though she left town. And her daughters knew she wouldn't do that anyway, not without telling them, so now what? Well, the police department opens an official case and detectives get to work fast. They need to confirm that Rachel has not left town on her own. So they're checking the airlines, the bus records, even making sure she's not in the hospital or in jail. Everyone knew Rachel was glued to her cell phone. She would not have left them hanging and everyone sitting there calling and texting and trying to get a hold of her. Where could she be where she wouldn't have access to her phone? Well, she wasn't in any of those places that I just mentioned. Her phone may hold a clue though. Modern technology, it comes in handy in these cases. So they look into getting Rachel's phone records. They already looked at her bank records and there was no activity from Rachel since Friday night, April 16th. And her daughter said that is highly unusual. Rachel was a shopper. She was always buying something, even if it was something small. She would have used that card since Friday. They're trying to build a timeline. It's as though Rachel had actually been missing for three days because it is Monday. So we've got Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and now she's still not here. Amber wasn't gonna just stand around and do nothing. She had a thousand flyers printed and she was passing them around, hanging them up everywhere around town. There was a picture of Rachel on these flyers and her description, five foot four, approximately 120 pounds, small stature, black hair, brown eyes, and a number two call in case anyone had seen or heard from her. Not only that, Amber immediately went straight to the media. She needed to get the word out. And once she got it out locally, tons of local news stations and then beyond started to run Rachel's story. Amber spoke with reporters at every single opportunity she had. She was adamant about keeping her mom's name and her picture in the news because it meant more pressure on the police. To get to the bottom of this, 
to find her mom. Here's a clip from KXLY news station based in Spokane, Washington. They sent one of the reporters out to Clarkston as soon as the news broke. They were like, pack your bags, get in your car and go. And I don't wanna say this phrase because it's not exactly where we are right now, but if it bleeds, it leads. I hate the phrase, but it's true. They showcased the missing persons flyer during this news segment and they interviewed Amber. Let's take a look. Just keep your eye out, keep spreading the word and if anybody had seen her or the vehicle over the weekend, um, we want to report it to the police. This would not be Amber's last time making a plea to the public to help find her mom. She started a Facebook page called Help Me Find My Missing Mom, Rachel Anderson. She was so desperate for answers that she asked in a post on Facebook if anyone knew how to read a forensic astrology chart. I have to say, I'd never heard of one of these before. Had you? Because I, I know I did not. But according to Slate.com, these forensic astrologers, they search the skies for clues to earthly crimes. What do you think about all this? Because recently, TikTok psychics, they have come under fire. And that's because they have committed actual defamation for accusing people or predicting suspects of a crime. A forensic astrology chart takes the date that the person went missing, and then you create a last seen chart, which is similar to a birth chart, if you've ever seen one of those before, where you put the date and the time you were born. Well, it tells you where the sun, the moon, and the planets are at the time, and this is supposed to help guide you. Same with a forensic chart. These astrologers, they use the placements on this chart to try to pinpoint who the suspects are or even where a body is located. In the case where you want to try this, there is a link in my sources below for forensicastrologer.com. And this includes a crime chart and how to use it. Meanwhile, detectives decide to emergency ping Rachel's phone. It's called an exigent circumstances ping. This will give them a chance to track where the phone was active last. Within hours, they get the information with a hit on that last ping. It was linked to Lewiston, Idaho. This is the same city that Rachel works in, so it seems very hopeful. Maybe her car broke down, and then her phone died when she was going to work. Maybe she's stranded somewhere. But when detectives really pinpoint the exact area, it leads them to a vast empty field in the middle of nowhere, a very agricultural area, which included deep canyons in Nez Perce County, in an area off Werner Road and Lindsay Creek Road. It's just rolling hills, dirt, grass, for as far as the eye can see. Here it is, right on the screen. It's a very far out of the way from where Rachel would have been going. But it is only a 13 minute drive away from her home. So the Essendon County Sheriff's Office need help. They enlist multiple jurisdictions to assist in their search. Are they looking for Rachel dead or alive? Was it too late? Why would her phone be in an empty field? Rachel's immediate and extended family band together and they walked around for hours with officers searching all day and into the night, all over this area where Rachel's phone last pinged. There were volunteer search and rescue groups, canine bloodhounds, and there's bad news. Rachel's phone is no longer logging activity. They believe that that emergency ping probably drained what was left of her battery or the phone was powered off. By the next day on Tuesday, April 20th, Captain Halley formed a task force. Their first order of duty was to track down William Slump. Remember him? They also want to check out Rachel's other exes, her ex-boyfriends, ex-husbands, and the neighbor that Rachel had reported that kept persistently asking her out on dates. Anyone could be a suspect at this point. They also had information that the person stalking Rachel had also been harassing her husband, Charles Capone. So they needed to know more. Maybe Charles can provide additional examples of these messages and maybe they can link them to Rachel's whereabouts. Detectives had already talked to neighbors and family members, and now it was time to go a little bit deeper. And we all know the first person that they look at is gonna be the boyfriend or the husband of a missing woman. Charles is high up on their list for two reasons. He was close with Rachel and he was also being harassed, seemingly by the same person. He could be in danger. Captain Halley, along with the Moscow Police Department, make a trip over to his auto shop which was in Moscow, Idaho. And right away, it was as though Charles was actually relieved that Captain Halley was there because he explained to them, Rachel had already shared Captain Halley's information with him and told him that he was the one helping her with the stalker. So Charles let Halley know that he was also trying to help Rachel get to the bottom of it, but he didn't have any real leads. They had also changed their phone numbers and this person still found them. However, he did have her car as evidence of the damage that the stalker had done. 
since he was currently repairing it for the second time. First it was the slashed tires, and then it was that back windshield. Charles also let the police listen to those voice messages that were on his phone, as well as read all of the text that he had been receiving and that he had shared with Rachel. And they sounded exactly the same. Plus, one of the voice messages that was on Rachel's even mentioned Charles, and not by name, but listen to this. We've tried to explain things. We tried texting, tried messing with your almost ex-husband. He didn't get it. He changed his phone number. You changed your phone number. You never apologize. You see us all the time. It's funny. You just don't get it. The creepy caller refers to him as her almost ex-husband and how they've tried messaging him repeatedly and messing with him and how they both changed their numbers to try to throw this person off to no avail. I noticed that they also said you never apologize to us at the time. They say us. So who are they? The detectives also asked Charles when he saw Rachel last and he tells them it was on Friday evening. She came by to exchange vehicles but he had a very busy day that day and he wasn't done fixing her car. He had loaned her a white GMC Yukon. Charles was very cooperative the entire time and he was shocked to learn that Rachel was missing, but he also figured there had to be a reasonable explanation. But still, the officers had to ask him point blank if he had anything to do with her disappearance and he said no. Then they went on to ask him if he had anything to do with her tires being slashed and again, he said absolutely not. Last, they asked if he broke her windshield and again, he says no. Charles said he had nothing to hide and admitted, sure, they were separated, but they were still close. He even drove around with Rachel looking for her ex, William Slump. He had planned to tell the guy off. They had even connected one of the phone numbers that were calling them and texting them to a payphone that was close to where William lived. They felt like they were on the right track, but now Rachel was gone. Officers want to know what happened after Rachel was informed that her car wasn't ready that night, and he explained that Rachel went to Office Depot to look for a computer. She bought the computer and then she decided to stop at a convenience store where she picked up a pack of beer for them. She came back to the shop. They had a couple beers together. They hung out for a little bit. Then she said she had to go and she left. This gives detectives another clue. Rachel was under the influence. How many beers did she actually have? Sometimes when people say, oh, I had a couple beers, it turns out it was way more than two. She could have gone into an accident. So they decide they have enough information from Charles at this point. They set off to retrace Rachel's path from Charles's repair shop back to her home in Clarkston. As you see, it's a route that consists of vast amounts of land on both sides down Highway 95. Look, she passes right through this land with canyons and it looks very similar to the fields that her family was searching. Could she have ended up here instead? Well, something did. The next day, on April 21st, the 1997 white GMC Yukon that Rachel was borrowing and that she was last seen leaving Charles's in Moscow with was found. It was right here in this parking lot. It was unlocked, the keys were still inside, and her purse was in plain sight. This Dynamart gas station, it's definitely on her way home from Moscow, but it doubled as something else. It was actually a bus station. I know. I had never seen this before. But the North Lewiston Dynamart in Lewiston, Idaho is a Greyhound curbside stop. You can purchase a ticket and be picked up by the bus right here. It seemed like a positive thing. Maybe Rachel did leave on the bus, but the fact that she left behind her personal belongings and her phone stopped pinging in a random field did not add up. Rachel's sister both said that Rachel always hid her purse somewhere out of sight if she was gonna go into like a store for a moment. Seeing it out in the open like that was a big red flag. Granted, this bus station is only eight minutes away from where Rachel's phone pinged and a nine minute drive from her house. I don't know if the times were the same back then, but in 2010 on the website, it says that the stop closes at 7 p.m. So what time did Rachel leave Moscow and why would she go to a bus station? It did not make sense or did it? Detectives realized that there could be a very horrifying connection between where they located this Yukon vehicle and a recent abduction of two girls just a few weeks before in March. These two women were leaving a Snoop Dogg concert in Portland, Oregon, when a man named Paul Winkleblack approached them. Paul told them that he worked for the Portland Police Department as a spotter. I don't even know what that is, but he said that he just wanted to help these ladies. He told them that they seemed to be intoxicated and he didn't want police to come and arrest them for drunk driving. So Paul told them that they needed to be escorted out of this parking lot immediately. 
Both of the girls were like, no, no thanks. And they declined Paul's offer and got back into their vehicle, but then he wouldn't leave. Instead, he was standing outside their car and he told them that the police were gonna be waiting for them and that they would be stopped if they drove off. So these women were scared. They didn't really know what to do. They felt like they were kind of out of options. They did consume drinks that night and they wanted to avoid being pulled over and getting a DUI. So that's when the women decided that they were just gonna leave their vehicle in the parking lot overnight and find another way home. But Paul said he was gonna have their car towed if they left it unattended. So due to them feeling like they were between a rock and a hard place with a lack of options and trusting that this man worked for the police, the two women actually let Paul drive them in their car. They believed this was Paul's responsibility as a police officer to get them home safely. Paul drove around downtown Portland. He then merged onto I-4 and he started to go south. That's when he took out a knife and he started to threaten one of the women and he forced her to take several pills. The car then slowed down on Detroit Lakes exit and Paul pulled to the side of the road as the woman attempted to escape, but he took out his knife again. One woman, however, did escape and she ran and she got to a house and she begged them to please let her use the phone to call 911. Meanwhile, the second woman, she also managed to somehow escape from him. I don't know how. And she just hid. The Marion County Sheriff's Office responded and they located both of these women, but Paul Winkleblack fled. This man was still on the loose and get this, his cell phone was found within a couple miles of this same parking lot where the Yukon was. At the time this occurred, this man had an outstanding warrant for third degree SA, a probation violation, and he was a registered offender. And I think you know what kind I'm talking about. Detectives start to wonder if Paul had anything to do with Rachel's disappearance, but he was in the area weeks ago and they don't see any concrete connection between the two. But he is on their list. For now, they get a search warrant for the GMC Yukon that Charles let Rachel borrow, and it was impounded at the crime lab for inspection. Meanwhile, detectives tracked down the suspicious neighbor, the one who kept asking Rachel out on dates, and it turns out he left town right after Rachel went missing. But when he was questioned, he had a rock-solid alibi. And remember William Slump, the ex-boyfriend, well, as unwelcoming as his letters were to Rachel, he denied being involved in any harassment. He also had an alibi and it checked out. They were back to square one. So they turned to the media for help. They want to know if anyone had seen the 1997 white GMC Yukon anywhere that Friday night between Moscow and Clarkston. On April 26, the Lewiston Morning Tribune put out this information. It said, quote, Anyone who may have noticed suspicious activity possibly involving a white GMC Yukon on back roads or highways between Moscow and Clarkston in the late night hours of April 16th or the early morning hours of April 17th, you're asked to report the incident to police. Detectives are also interested in suspicious activity north of Moscow during the same time frame. End quote. Now that they have all of Rachel's phone records, they're able to establish how creepy these calls were. The caller was using a service called spoofcard.com. This was an app that changes your voice and it also hides your phone number. Digging deeper, the detectives discover Rachel was also receiving emails. They were anonymously sent with pictures of mutilated bodies from unsolved murder cases. No wonder this woman was sleeping on the couch with the lights on and a loaded gun by her side. Now it's time for detectives to look at Rachel's debit card activity. They wanted to confirm the computer purchase and the stop at that convenience store, but there were no charges and it seemed really suspicious. So they asked Charles and he told them, I gave her my debit card. He said it was typical for them to both purchase things from each other's account. So he said that he gave the debit card to her when she came to the shop. When they ran his records, they were able to confirm the exact time that she checked out at that office depot that Friday night. It was around 6 p.m. It took about 20 or 30 minutes in the store. And then she went to Third Street Market where she purchased a pack of beer. Both of those charges were on Charles' debit card. And the receipt for that shows that she purchased it at 7.07 .07 p.m. So that means she wouldn't have been able to get on a bus at the bus station. Then she went back to Charles's repair shop, according to Charles, but how could this be confirmed? Well, it wouldn't be confirmed by Charles 
because his lawyer told him to stop communicating with police. It's actually pretty normal to retain an attorney, even in this situation, if you're not guilty. And they're just digging into Charles's life at this point, so it's wise for him to protect himself. But they also see this as a red flag. Why stop talking to them? Doesn't he want to help? Well, maybe not. It turns out Charles was in trouble. This was unrelated to what was happening with Rachel. But while interviewing him and doing a background check and searching his auto shop, detectives discovered firearms in his possession and they issued a warrant for his arrest. The 48-year-old was charged with two counts of unlawful possession of a firearm. Now, wait a minute. Let me explain. Charles is being accused of possessing a Glock pistol, a Remington rifle, and a Mossberg 12-gauge shotgun. And this wouldn't exactly be an issue if it wasn't for the fact that Mr. Charles, uh, I'm a holy Christian that blesses meals in public, Capone was a convicted felon. And I doubt that Rachel knew about this. Felons can't possess firearms. Charles had been convicted of aggravated battery and burglary in 1998 in Latah County, Idaho. And get this, bank larceny. Seriously, how, how does somebody hide something like this? That was back in 1997. So eventually Charles is arrested on these firearm charges Here's what KXLY News had to say following his federal arraignment in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Today, Capone pled not guilty to two counts of possession felony of a firearm with his court-appointed lawyer sitting by his side. The Moscow business owner was arrested on May 6 after detectives found firearms belonging to Capone, a violation of his probation. Capone was the last person to see Rachel Anderson alive when the Clarkson woman disappeared on April 16th. No one has seen her since. So there you have it. Rachel's estranged husband behind bars until July, and Rachel is still missing. So he needed an attorney for sure. And I doubt he wanted to be linked to the disappearance of his estranged wife on top of these other charges. But is he connected? Detectives decide to canvas the area around the repair shop in Moscow, Idaho. They also obtained a search warrant for the shop itself. They want to see if anyone saw Rachel or the white Yukon. And finally, they get a big break in the case. Tim Fountain. He was in his front yard playing with his mom's dog on the evening of Friday, April 16th. He said he was outside for about 15 minutes when he saw a vehicle entering the parking lot at Charles Repair Shop. The reason this caught his attention was because of the way it skidded to a stop in front of Charles's shop. It was as though the driver was aggressively driving in a threatening way. Tim knew that Charles was the owner and he recognized him standing outside. Tim saw a dark haired woman jump out of the vehicle and start to scream at Charles. She was flailing her arms and she got right in his face and Charles kept responding calmly. But he sounded like he was restrained every time the woman would pause. It's like he was holding back. So the detectives asked him what he thought was going on. And he said it just looked like a man and his wife disagreeing over something. When they asked him for more details on what the woman looked like, he said he was like 50 feet away and he couldn't make out any facial features. But the woman was a similar height as Charles, except thin, and he could only really make out their silhouettes of their upper body. Tim wasn't able to tell what make or model the vehicle was or even what color it was. But when he was asked, could it be a GMC Yukon? He said, yeah, it could have been. He also had no idea what either one of them were saying to each other. He just based everything on the body language and the tone as the noise traveled. The police wanted to know what else Tim saw. He told them that he noticed Charles would walk in and out of the doorway, but the lady would just continue to scold him and she would never go all the way inside. She just kind of lingered in the doorway half in and half out. However, it's what he told them next that was absolutely chilling. He said he went back to play with his mom's dog. He turned his back to the shop and then he heard the last words he would from that woman. According to Tim, she said, no. And then she inhaled. So it's like, no, <gasps> like that sigh, that, that shocking sound coming out of her mouth. Then he heard a loud bang. And he said it sounded like metal hitting metal. It could have even been a large caliber pistol. But whatever it was, it definitely came from that shop. And after that, he didn't hear or see the woman again. Tim said there were just no voices. It was silent. So he assumed that maybe something tipped over. He started to walk towards the shop to see if anyone was hurt, and that's when he saw the door open and close a couple times. At this time, he was close enough to where he could hear a second man talking to Charles. He didn't know who the man was or where he came from, 
but he said he heard two men. He heard one man ask Charles a question and Charles reply. Tim was curious. He continued to walk across his yard to the road between his mom's house and the shop. And that's when he saw the woman's vehicle heading towards the highway. When asked who was driving, Tim said he could not tell and he didn't know which direction that the car went in. What he could hear when he was about 35 feet away was what sounded like an object being moved inside. It sounded like a table was being pushed across the floor. Then, possibly something like a pressure washer starting up. After that, he went back to his mom's yard and continued playing with his dog, just throwing the ball back and forth. He told detectives he didn't think anything was wrong. He believed the woman got into the vehicle and she drove off, but authorities are not so sure. They get a more extensive search warrant for the premises and are still thoroughly analyzing the Yukon, which just turned up some very questionable evidence. They find the tip of a finger of a black latex glove like it had been torn off, and that was in the front seat. There was a piece of paper in the vehicle that had information regarding that computer that Rachel was going to purchase from Office Depot, and the paper appeared to have what looked like a blood smear on the bottom of it. Then they opened up Rachel's purse and they saw what looked like blood droplets inside on the inside. There was a bag of paperwork that belonged to Rachel and was located in the back seat and the bag contained all of those notes. All the paperwork that Rachel was supposed to bring to that appointment at the police department with Captain Hallie. The vehicle was otherwise very clean and that was actually unusual. Rachel's friends and family said, that's not Rachel. Rachel leaves vehicles very cluttered and messy, even if she's only been driving a car for a day. And wow, I never knew something like that would come in handy as a clue, but that was part of Rachel's character. So the lack of clutter actually stood out here. Not only that, the driver's seat was pushed back into a position where it wouldn't have been appropriate for someone of Rachel's stature, indicating that someone else was the last person to drive that vehicle. But what's even more telling and scarier and more damning is that a cadaver dog hit on the cargo area in the back of that vehicle. These are the kind of dogs that are trained to detect human remains, not blood. So this isn't good. They sent the items to get DNA tested. And meanwhile, something else was found inside the Yukon that changed the narrative. Divorce papers. We know that Charles and Rachel are separated, but Charles made it seem like they were working things out. To the contrary, according to the divorce documents found in the Yukon, Rachel filed for divorce as early as January 8th. There was a letter attached from her attorney, Scott Galena, and a second divorce document dated January 14th. Detectives do not think it's a mere coincidence that these documents were inside this vehicle. They looked freshly printed, waiting for a signature from none other than Charles Capone himself. This leads them to believe Rachel intended to present those papers to Charles that night, coupled with the eyewitness testimony from that neighbor, Tim Fountain, it's looking as though Charles is their number one suspect. He had the means, the motive, and the opportunity to harm Rachel. They just needed proof because we know people are innocent until proven guilty. They pull up Charles's and Rachel's phone records, including all of their text messages from the days leading up to the disappearance and on the day she went missing. And I don't know if you like these kind of details, but I do. I love when I can get records and read through them. So I'm gonna do that. There's not that many of them. I just find them to be very telling. On April 16th, there's a text from Charles to Rachel at 7.38 a.m. It said, it took me a while to figure out why you wouldn't take my truck. It's not misleading to me. It's that you have been either ashamed of me because you hang up when you get to Dermis's because you tell him you don't talk to me and you're not telling your kids either. I'm not someone who needs to be kept in the closet. I understand, but not at my cost, Rachel. Hmm. Definitely sounds like Charles is a little bit bitter. I'm not sure who the Dermis person is, but maybe that's someone Rachel's talking to or dating. And then at 11, 18 a.m., Charles texted Rachel and said, you have more money in your account. I will do the car payment next. So, okay, it does seem as though Charles is helping to pay her bills and to deposit funds into her bank account. Remember, they were essentially working the repair business together. And then right after this, Rachel called the Office Depot in Moscow, Idaho, and she asked them to hold a computer for her and said that she would come get it sometime later that day. Okay, we know from Charles that Rachel supposedly did go back to pick up this computer. 
Now bear with me on these next ones. I promise this will all make more sense as I integrate more information about who these people are in the next couple of minutes. But the next text message that Charles sends is to a friend named Bert Bogdan. Charles has been currently living with Bert and his wife, Carol, and they've been allowing Charles to live with them while he was separated from Rachel. We will hear more about him because detectives are going to bring in Bert for an interview along with anyone else that's mentioned or texted. At 1.37 p.m., Charles texted Bert and said, Hey Bert, I'm curious if you have any openings at Amplicon that you need filled. Just 10 minutes later at 1.48 p.m., Bert texted Charles back and said, We do not in the foreseeable future. Next step would be a mid-level PhD in microbiology or bioinformatics. To which Charles texted Bert back and said, Thought I would check, because I know someone with a lot of skills in office and lab environments. It sounds like to me, from what I know, Charles is hoping that he can find a position for Rachel. She's currently a lab technician. I don't know if she holds a PhD in microbiology or bioinformatics, but it seems as though money is an issue, and the next text kind of confirms this. Listen, at 2.23 p.m., Charles texted Rachel and said, I'll get a second job at Walmart stocking. It's almost 13 an hour and I can do 25 hours a week. You have the boys and I have no life. So what the heck is an extra 800 a month? Then 10 minutes later at 2.31, Charles texted Rachel and said, just made the car payment, insurance is next. I didn't know what to make of these text messages. They didn't sound threatening. They sound desperate to me. It's as though he's trying to prove to Rachel that he can still support them. But these next two calls are really significant. Later that evening, Rachel called Charles at 6.59 p.m. for one minute. Rachel's cell phone hit the cell tower between downtown Moscow and Charles's shop. This is called the Paradise Creek Tower. In the same minute, 6.59, Rachel calls him a second time for under a minute. And her cell hits the same tower between downtown Moscow and Charles's shop. Again, that's the Paradise Creek Tower. But just a couple minutes later at 7.02, Rachel called Charles for two minutes. This time, her cell phone hits the tower closer to Charles's shop. It's called Paradise Ridge Tower, not the Paradise Creek Tower. This shows that she was either very close or actually at his shop at this time, which does coincide with the information that they were given from Charles. And then at 7.15 p.m., Charles called Rachel's phone for two minutes, and his cell phone hit the same tower at his shop, Paradise Ridge Tower. Five minutes later, 7.20, Charles called Rachel for two minutes, again hitting the tower by his shop, Paradise Ridge. 10 minutes later, this is 7.30 p.m., Charles calls Rachel's phone for four minutes, cell phone hitting the same tower, Paradise Ridge. I'm just sitting here thinking, why all these phone calls? Why? Now at 8.09 p.m., Rachel called one of her ex-husbands, Dennis Plunkett. She has the six-year-old son, Gavin, with him, and she leaves him a voice message saying that she had a question for him. This was the last outgoing call or text from Rachel's phone. This call hit off the Paradise Ridge Tower, so we know she was alive and well at 8.09 p.m. on Friday night and probably at Charles's shop. And we know Tim Fountain saw a woman there that night. At 8.27 p.m., Charles sent a text to Rachel. The text hit a tower by Charles' shop, Paradise Ridge. And a couple minutes later at 8.29, Rachel's ex-husband, Dennis, the one that she just called, attempts to call her back, but it goes straight to voicemail. That time, the call hit an unknown tower. And there's reasons for this. But again, at 8.38 p.m., Dennis tries to call Rachel again, but it goes to voicemail. And it hits an unknown tower. The reason that it hits an unknown tower most times is because either a phone has no service or it's turned off or it's in airplane mode. So it's not actually hitting off anything at this point. By 9.20 p.m., all incoming texts and calls to Rachel's phone went unanswered. And it was hitting off of 500 Than Road Tower until the phone died or it was shut off at 3.03 p.m. on April 19th when they emergency pinged it to get its location. And I looked at the location of the cell tower and it is right near that field where Rachel's cell phone last pinged. I love details because we get to see exactly what the detectives are finding step by step and how it's all coming together. That night at 9.59 p.m., Charles's phone shows duplicate text messages to Rachel. I was wondering why. 
Sometimes if it doesn't go through to someone's phone, the person will text again, and that's what I think was happening here. The first one that was a duplicate said, I'm sorry, Rachel, I did the best I could to get it done. It was sent twice. Like I said, probably because it wasn't going through. And that 10.08 p.m., again, duplicate text message saying, hello. This is as though he's checking in to see if she's ignoring him. And at 10.15 p.m., Charles's phone shows a text to Rachel saying, I finished it. You can have it tomorrow. Please call me with three exclamation points. Charles doesn't text Rachel again until the next morning on Saturday. This is at 8.01 a.m. And he says, hey, I know you're impatient, but I did it as fast as I could. Can you get up here today? Or I will meet you halfway. No response from her. So at 9 a.m., Charles texts her again with, I'm at the shop all day. Call me and we can swap rigs. Rigs is how Charles refers to different vehicles, which I found was actually a weird way to do so since, I don't know, I think it refers more to like a sailing instrument or a device like a light, a rig. A rig is how he refers to vehicles. So now you know. Later at 1.37 p.m., Charles texted Rachel's phone and said, it's after lunch. Are you gonna call? Are you still mad about not getting the car? Call me back. No response from Rachel. So at 5.43 p.m., Charles texted again with, hello, 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 sent two times. Finally, at 6.30 p.m., Charles texted her phone, hey, your mailbox on your home and cell is full. What's the deal? Why are you being so standoffish today? Charles doesn't text again until the next morning on Sunday at 8.54 asking her, are you going to church? Are you going to call? Nothing. At 1.01 p.m., Charles texted Rachel's phone again saying, Rachel, what's wrong? We do need to trade vehicles. Stop ignoring me. And that was sent two times. Nothing is sent back from Rachel. And then at 7.22 p.m., Charles texted her, okay, enough is enough. You need to call me. I'm not liking the silent treatment. But he didn't text her again that night. Of course, he did start back up the very next day on Monday, pretty early this time at 6.31. And he said, hello, I gave you all weekend and you ignored me. Stop. After work today, I really need to get the Yukon back. Bert's leaving for Japan, and I think he has people coming in from out of town, and they will need the extra rig. So this Yukon I told you about that Rachel's been borrowing, that's actually Bert's vehicle. But at this point, it seems as though Charles is using that fact to put more pressure on Rachel to return the car, or to meet up with him, or call him back. But there is still no answer from Rachel. Now remember, Rachel did not show up to work on Monday. It turns out she also missed work on Saturday, but her workplace let that one slide as though it was maybe a one-time thing, even though she never called in. But by Monday, they were concerned. That morning, however, Charles called the pathology lab and he was looking for Rachel. He didn't identify himself, but he said that he's been working on her car and it's ready for pickup. According to the person who took this call at Rachel's work, Charles told them, that he called the police in Clarkson to report her missing. However, there is no report of Charles ever calling law enforcement, which is pretty interesting. Charles also called Rachel's daughter, Amber, at 1230. And this is after Amber had reported Rachel missing. And Amber told detectives that Charles called her and said that he had accidentally turned his phone off for the four previous hours if she had tried to call him. That's really interesting. Why would it be significant, I wonder? <laughs> well, by 2.45, Rachel's phone pings out in that empty field in the middle of nowhere. It would have been really convenient if Charles had turned off his phone so he could drive over there and dump Rachel's phone out in the middle of the field, wouldn't it? That's what detectives are thinking. Or was it just a coincidence? Then, at 6 p.m., Charles talked to Amber on the phone. And according to Amber, Charles said that he was going to come down to Lewiston where the phone pinged, and he was going to help them search for Rachel, but he never showed up. It doesn't really sound like a man who cared about this woman. By the very next day, on Tuesday, April 20th, Charles was contacted by law enforcement at his shop, and we know what he told detectives. Now let me tell you what was obtained through the extensive search warrant of that shop. Initially, they merely took a look inside while they were talking to Charles, but after his arrest, they're able to get a more extensive warrant. While searching the auto repair shop, a box of black latex gloves are found in Charles's truck. And in the loft of his shop, there was a blue tarp covering items that had a lot of paint overspray on them. There was another green tarp 
that appeared to be brand new, but they also found something they considered even more significant. It was a prescription bottle of Ambien, and this is a sleeping pill, and it has a familiar name on it, Carol Bogdan. That's not Charles's name. That is the wife of Bert. Charles is living with them. It was time for detectives to pay them a little visit and find out what's going on here. Why would sleeping pills be at Charles's workplace? It's not as though you typically take them during the day. Plus, he's in possession of prescription drugs that do not belong to him. This prescription was for 15 pills and it states to take half a pill at a time. There were only 14 pills in the bottle. Do the math. Carol Bogdan was interviewed and she said, Charles had been staying with her since February. The detectives confronted her about the Ambien and she told them she never gave Charles a bottle of medication, but in fact, she had given him one or two pills to help him sleep. He later approached her husband and he told them about the bottle of Ambien that was in the shop. During that meeting, Charles reportedly said to Bert that police were only going to see it the way they wanted to. And he said, quote, I bet they think I put sleeping pills in Rachel's beer. But at that point, no one in that investigation had said anything about putting any drugs in Rachel's beer. So that definitely looks suspicious. Carol also tells them that Charles was not home by midnight on April 16th and that she didn't even see him when she woke up at eight o'clock in the morning on Saturday. When she did finally see him that night, he was acting unusual. When detectives interview her husband, Bert Bogdan, he tells them that Charles was trying to win Rachel back. He was trying to save the marriage, doing everything he could, looking for books for them, doing therapy appointments, paying her bills, paying her car payments. But there was something Bert didn't like that Charles was doing. He was following Rachel around, sitting outside her house, and obsessing over whether or not she was dating other men. Charles told Bert that he had been at Rachel's one time and he hid and he watched and he waited for her to come home one night. And then around 1.30 in the morning, he told Bert she was drunk and alone. And Bert said, you are stalking her. That's when Bert said to Charles, do you have a gun? And he said, yeah. And Bert actually talked Charles into giving him that gun for safekeeping. Bert told the detectives he didn't know what Charles might do in the state of mind he was in after the breakup. The timeline of when this occurred lines up to when Rachel first started to contact the Clarkson Police Department about getting those weird text messages around February 21st. She actually told them, according to records, that she thought it might even be Charles, but she wasn't as confident since she was leaning more towards it being William. Bert also told detectives that at 6.15 p.m. on the night that Rachel went missing, Bert was with his kids at Baskin Robbins in Moscow, and he saw Rachel drive by in his Yukon. He had given Rachel permission to use it, and he said he was positive it was his Yukon, and he was positive that Rachel was driving. He did not see Charles come home that night. And at 8.15 a.m. the next morning on Saturday, Bert and Carol noticed that Charles is still not home. So they assume he came home after they went to bed and must have left before they woke up. But they don't know if he ever came home during that night. It wasn't until 6.30 p.m. on that Saturday night that Charles came back home. That's when Carol went into Charles' room to let him know that she had some food for him and she found him completely passed out sleeping. He would kind of wake up, but then he would fall right back to sleep. He must have been really tired. I wonder why. The next day, on Sunday, the Bogdan said that Charles got up and he went to church. And when he came back, he helped them with some yard work. And he seemed fine on Sunday. On Tuesday, the day the detectives went out to the repair shop to talk to Charles, he came home to the Bogdans and he told them, according to him, that he had been interrogated all day by the police. Later telling Bert, everything will be okay because I have an ace. Charles said that he was with someone on Friday, someone who could account for his whereabouts. But why didn't he give anyone the name of this person? This makes sense with what we heard from Tim Fountain. He said he heard two men at the shop that night. So who was there and why hadn't they come forward? That same night, Bert asked Charles to move out of their home. He did. He moved into the Hillcrest Motel. And then later on May 5th, Charles was arrested on that firearm charge. But right before he got arrested that day, 
Guess where else he was? At Bert's place of business, a laboratory where they conduct testing. He came there around 11.30 a.m. And that's when Bert told Charles, if you have anything to do with Rachel's disappearance, you need to tell everything to the police. Charles said his family said the same thing and that he told them, no way. And I wondered if he meant, no way, I didn't do it, or no way am I going to police. This is also when Charles mentioned the sleeping pills, how I told you he thought, oh, they're going to think I put one in Rachel's beer. And it was interesting because there was one missing. Charles also confided in Bert that he found out since Rachel's disappearance that she had a boyfriend. And that's when he said, you know what? The cops should really be questioning him, not me. Then he went on to say that the police asked him for a sample of his DNA. And that's when the conversation got weird. As though it wasn't already weird, but Charles proceeds to ask Bert if the police can find DNA in sweat and that he wanted to find out if the police were doing the DNA work correctly. And I'm sitting here thinking, why is he trying to check on the police's work? Like, why is he doing that? And Bert answered by telling Charles that was not the kind of DNA work that his company was involved in. So he did not know the answer to that. Then the room that Charles was staying in at the Bogdans was searched and various items were taken into evidence, including the tip of a black latex glove and some black hair. Another tip off of a glove. Wow. I know what you're thinking at this point, that everything's really adding up. Well, there's more. Detectives need to know who is this ace, the person Charles was telling Bert that he could have verify his alibi. So they're going down a list of potential people, friends of Charles's, and they come across Tim Wheaton. This is not Tim Fountain, not the one with the dog outside of the shop. Tim Wheaton is a close friend of Charles since 2001. He tells detectives that Charles spoke to him about fights that he would have with his wife, Rachel Anderson. In particular, he remembers a fight in November or December of 2009 where Charles told him that he got physically violent with Rachel, and that's huge. That connects Charles to at least having the ability and the intention of harming Rachel, and this is not long before she disappeared. Tim also says he knows about the bad texting and voice messages, including that Charles told him that even his pastor had counseled him to stop texting and contacting Rachel. Can a pastor testify in court? I should look that up. I wonder if confessions in church are confidential. Hang on, I'm gonna be right back. Statements made to a minister, priest, rabbi, or other religious leader are generally considered privileged or confidential communications. State laws generally exempt a pastor from having to testify in court or to law enforcement about what was discussed in a church confession. Wow, there you have it. I graduated from law school and I still did not know that one. Tim said that in early February, Charles had been in a tirade about the relationship with Rachel, and he wanted the marriage to continue, but he also admitted that he borrowed cars from his customers of his auto shop in Moscow, Idaho, and he would drive around Rachel's house in Clarkston, Washington to check up on her activities. He also said he had a friend who lived near Rachel, and he would have his friend drive by Rachel's house to check on her. So Bert was right. That's stalking behavior for sure. But who's this friend? I see why detectives' jobs take so long because every time they interview someone, they get more information and then they have to follow up on that. So before they locate this other friend, Tim drops a bombshell. He says that in February, Charles told him in reference to Rachel that he could kill the bitch and bury her body and no one would ever find it. Okay, that's a little crazy. Like. That's kind of dumb. Are criminals that dumb? Why would you tell somebody that? If it's even true, but why would this guy Tim lie? Apparently Charles also told Tim that his business wasn't doing well and that he was about 250,000 to 300,000 in the hole. Tim also said Charles used to stalk and harass his prior wives and a prior girlfriend and he had a drinking problem. When he drank, he became vicious and mean and we know he was drinking the night Rachel went missing and that was by his own admission. This is a lot to take in. They want to track down this friend who supposedly helped Charles keep tabs on Rachel. So they go back through his cell phone data and all of his text messages, and they locate a guy named Nathan D. Donner. He was in contact with Nathan in the recent weeks leading up to Rachel's disappearance. It really seems like he's going to the extreme, even having other people check up on her. Like, what's his motive? Captain Halley brings Nathan in for an interview. He says, we know that you've been talking to Charles 
and you've been providing information about Rachel and what she's been doing. So we asked Nathan, how long have you known Charles? How did you meet? And he told him that they met back in 2006 when he used to be a FedEx driver that delivered to Charles Repair Shop. It was interesting because when the detective asked him how long he knew Rachel or how he knew Rachel, he said that he had known her since high school and he was the one that introduced Rachel and Charles. And that is heartbreaking. If it turned out that Rachel was not alive and it was because of Charles, just to think that you were the one that connected those two. He said that him and Charles were out at dinner one night and they decided to go to a bar and that was when they saw Rachel leaving. And Nathan recognized her and he said, hey, how are you? And then he introduced them to one another and later he finds out they got married. Hallie goes on to ask if Nathan knew whether or not they had any problems in their relationship. And he told them they had their spats and the detective wants to know, what do you mean? Well, Nathan says that Charles had a Vogue magazine in his shop. You know, when women customers come in, they're waiting for their car, they're going through the Vogue magazine. And Rachel apparently told him to get rid of those kind of magazines because she thought that they were sleazy and demeaning. And he said that Rachel would actually hit Charles if he looked at other women. So of course the detective wants to know, have you ever seen this? Have you ever seen Rachel actually hit Charles? And he says, no, I'm just basing this off of what Charles told me. As far as he was concerned, anytime he saw the couple together, they were all over each other, like loving each other. But as for the stalking, the detective wants to know if Charles ever asked Nathan to drive over to Rachel's to keep an eye on her. And Nathan tells him that Charles had said he wondered what Rachel was up to. And he did say that, hey, if you're gonna go past there, let me know if she's with anyone. Let me know what cars are out there. But he said he wasn't necessarily going by there for Charles. He had to go past Rachel's house because he was dating a girl who lived close by. He had to pass Rachel's to get there. But Charles had asked him just to keep an eye out, see if there were a bunch of other rigs at her house. But why would there be a bunch of rigs? We now understand rigs means vehicles. Why would there be a whole bunch of vehicles at her house? Did he mean other men? more than one, he just sounds kind of unstable. If Rachel wanted him to know her business, she would have made him a part of it. Nathan said on several occasions, Charles did ask him to go by there and tell him what vehicles were present. He wouldn't exactly report back to him, but if Charles called back to check, he would let him know. And they wanna know how many times, and he said maybe four times in the last few months. Finally, the detective asked some final questions if Charles ever talked about Rachel. And Nathan said Charles would say stuff about Rachel all the time, about how she ignored him, about how he was paying her bills. And finally, he gave him some advice. He was like, you know what? Just wash your hands of Rachel. She's the one that kicked you out. Move on. Nathan believed Charles was still in love with Rachel. He said he knew Charles loved her. He was always talking to his pastor about how to get her back and get her into counseling. But Nathan said it just got to a point where he didn't want to hear about it anymore. He got sick of it and he would just change the subject if it got brought up. Still sifting through the messages and the calls, the day that Rachel went missing, detectives find a call from Charles to someone named Alyssa Stone. And this is around 1.30 p.m. That's around the same time that Charles had texted Bert about the opening that he may have at his job. So they track down Alyssa Stone and she tells them, that she's the wife of David Christopher Stone, one of Charles's longtime friends. David's a high school baseball coach. He's a volunteer firefighter for the Moscow Fire Department. He's a wonderful stepfather and a family man. He wasn't just friends with Charles. Rachel's daughter, Amber, tells detectives that David was also Rachel's friend, and she referred to him as Stoney. She had only good things to say about David. Many of the detectives knew David and his wife, Alyssa, he worked at the Moscow City Maintenance Center and Alyssa worked at Moscow City Hall as a grants writer. Detectives want to know why Charles made a phone call to David's wife on the 16th and she tells them it was in regard to working on her car. David would work on cars with Charles. So that afternoon, David left to go work on her car at Charles's shop. They asked if she spoke to her husband David again that day and she says, yeah, around three o'clock. She called David and he told her he didn't even start to work on their car yet. Then again at 6 p.m., she calls David again, tells him dinner's ready. And he told her, you know what, Rachel showed up and she was not happy that her car wasn't ready. So David says, you know what, I'm gonna stay here with Charles and hopefully be able to work on your car. 
but that Charles was pretty upset. Then at 7 p.m., David called Alyssa and said that someone was delivering a car part for her car, and he was going to stay and put it on, and he would be home later. At 8 p.m., David calls his wife Alyssa again and says, oh, the wrong part was delivered for your car. So Alyssa asked David if he had eaten, and he said, oh, I went and got something from the A&W for me and Charles. This is great information. Detectives are hoping that David can answer some very important questions. It seems like they found the man who Charles referred to as his ace, according to what David's wife Alyssa showed them. It appeared as though David was the one at the shop that night with him. Alyssa goes on to say that between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m., David actually shows up at their house and he's driving Charles' truck. Alyssa said that David told him, I just dropped Charles off at Mingle's, which was the bar, and I'm going to go back and pick him up so he doesn't have to drive under the influence. Not too long later, David told Alyssa he would be right back. That Rachel had come back over after computer shopping and her car still wasn't done and she was mad. He then again went on to explain that Charles was pretty upset because Rachel was depressed and she wanted him to do a lot of things he couldn't do like pay her bills. This is all very interesting. But this story isn't the same as the one Charles told detectives. But they are hearing it from a third party, Alyssa, and not David himself. So they needed to track him down for an interview. When detectives meet with David, he confirms the information that Charles already gave to police. He tells them, sure, Rachel stopped by the shop. It was Friday evening, she wanted to switch cars, and the work was not done. And that David was having work done on Alyssa's vehicle that afternoon. But if David was truly with Charles, why didn't Charles just tell police right away? David also confirms that he brought Charles over to this bar and had a few drinks with him in between fixing Rachel's car that night. But Charles had never mentioned this bar either. If David's telling the truth, though, it was very easy to figure it out because Mingles had surveillance cameras. The detectives pull the footage, and guess what? They don't see David, and they don't see Charles. David has an explanation. He's like, you know what? I, I didn't go inside. But they're like, but there's no sign of Charles either. Because Charles and David seem to have very different accounts of that night and their calls and texts didn't match up and the timeline seemed off, it really raised suspicion into both of these men. Something wasn't adding up and they just could not put a finger on it. But speaking of finger, remember the tip of the glove in the Yukon? They finally did a DNA test. It contained both Rachel and Charles' skin cell DNA. It was also determined that Rachel's blood was on the piece of paper that was found on the floor and inside of her purse, but it was such a very small amount that it wasn't enough for Charles Capone to be charged with murder. But they weren't gonna give up. They're not gonna let this case go cold. But that's not what the public believed. The authorities were not giving out any information. The news was scarce. Police wouldn't tell the public what they found inside the repair shop or why Rachel was even there. The community was left in the dark. Where was Rachel Anderson? The frustration was apparent by the posts on the Facebook page that Rachel's family made. Everyone was trying to help. They were offering tips and theories. They would say things like, did you get EquiSearch to come out or Nancy Grace talk about the case to make it more public? But police assured them they were working hard. They just didn't want to compromise the case by exposing the evidence that they had. Even Charles' arrest was being downplayed by the police. They said, oh yeah, you know, he got arrested, but... It was unrelated, but it seemed too coincidental that Rachel's missing and her estranged husband is arrested on a weapons charge. It seems related to me, wouldn't it to you? Charles did end up pleading guilty to that firearm charge and he was sentenced to two years in federal prison. And Amber admitted that when her mom first started dating Charles, there was just something about him she did not like. She pulled her mom aside and she said, listen, mom, he seems like he's hiding something. And now the family thinks he's hiding Rachel. They're worried sick because if their mother is still alive and she's locked up somewhere and he's the only one that knows where she is and now he's in prison, they thought she could die. And they want them to hurry up and solve this case. However, the police have a plan. When they were searching the shop, they found these pictures of Charles. He was posing with guns. He was acting like a tough guy. He thought he was a tough guy because as far as he was concerned, he believed that he was actually a relative of Al Capone. His last name gave him a sense of power. And there's no relation that they could find between Charles Capone and Al Capone, even though they shared the same last name. So detectives believe that Charles will talk in prison, and they hope he does. They think it's only a matter of time. And in the meanwhile, they're still compiling 
as much evidence as possible. Here are some of the relevant findings. The mileage on Rachel Stratus was checked against the work order. There are 140 to about 150 unaccounted for miles on that car. Alyssa Stone was re-interviewed and she mentioned that Charles had actually borrowed her Dodge Durango to move out of the Bogdan's residence on Tuesday, April 20th, the day after Rachel was reported missing. And she said when Charles got back, she was so upset because he had used all of her gas and she had just filled up the tank. Not to mention there were at least seven major inconsistencies in David's timeline of events for the night that Rachel was last seen. And by his and Charles' own admissions, they were the last people to see her that night. I'm putting the inconsistencies up on the screen and I'll read them for you. Tell me what you think. Alyssa stated that David left to go to Charles' shop at 1.30 p.m. But David said he went to the shop around 4 or 4.30. So where was he all of those hours? Alyssa said David called her from the shop around 3 and told her he didn't even start working on the car yet. Phone records show David called the shop several times during the time he said he was at the shop. So which one was it? Well, David said, no, 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 I was at the shop. Charles was wearing an earpiece while he was working on a car and I was just calling him. I was sitting right there. I just wanted to mess with him. Interesting. You sure you weren't planning what you were gonna do that night? David said he went to the A&W around 7 p.m. and that he also went on the store side to buy some candy and he went through the front doors. Well, when they pulled up the video, he didn't go through the front doors. So he's like, oh, um, maybe I didn't. And maybe I didn't buy candy. So which one is it? See how frustrating it is for detectives? David said Rachel and the Yukon were gone when he got back from getting food shortly after 7 p.m. Rachel's phone records show something else. She made a call from the shop to her ex-husband, Dennis, at 8.09. So her car couldn't have been gone because she was in that area. Remember that David said that O'Reilly's delivered a part for the Durango but told his wife it was the wrong part? Well, the part was actually delivered for Rachel's car. When they asked, was the part delivered before you went for food or after, David tried to look at the timeline to figure it out instead of using his brain from his memory. At that point, getting flustered, he said, you know what? I think I might've been in the bathroom when the parts were delivered. David also said he dropped Charles off at Mingle's bar around 9.30 p.m. and picked him up at 10. But when they told him, you know what? Charles never went inside. David said, oh, well, I didn't watch him go in. I just dropped him out outside. So maybe uh, I don't know. David said when he returned to Mingles, he called Charles on the phone to pick him up. When David is told that there's no record of this call, David said that maybe Charles was just standing outside and he came by and he was waiting for him. Seriously, I'm sorry, but this is a mess. Like even when I'm explaining it to you, I'm just like, why? It's so confusing and convoluted. Like who, what is it? What is the truth? Well, Scott Galena, who was representing Rachel in her divorce, he confirms that as of April 12th, 2010, just a few days before she went missing, enough time had finally passed so that the divorce could be finalized. He said that a date had not been set, but that Charles had been increasingly insistent that they were gonna make a reconciliation and he wasn't gonna sign those papers. Rachel had also told her friend Jennifer that Charles had given her a three-day ultimatum concerning the relationship. The ultimatum was that Rachel had to give Charles an answer by Friday, the 16th, whether or not they were gonna work on their marriage. And Rachel had already told Jennifer, she was gonna tell Charles that night that the relationship was over. Well, there you go. Don't you think that this is the reason why all of this happened? If he couldn't have her, nobody could. Detectives found a receipt in the white Dodge Durango and it belonged to Charles. It was parked on the side of the shop and that receipt was from Spence Hardware. It was for a brown and green tarp. It was purchased on the 17th. That's the day after Rachel went missing. So the detectives tracked down some people who work at the shop and they told detectives that there had been an old green and brown tarp, just like the new one, but it had all this paint spray on it, just like that other one that was there. But all of a sudden, on the 17th, it was replaced with a brand new tarp. Where do you think the old tarp is and what it was used for? Time is going by. Detectives know that Charles is going to be let out of prison soon and they know he's a danger to society. They didn't want this man to walk free. Their job was to convince Latah County Prosecutor to take on Rachel's case as a murder case. Based on all the evidence and information gathered to date, the detectives believe David Stone and Charles Capone were involved in Rachel's disappearance, her murder, 
and the disposal of her remains. At this time, law enforcement officers from multiple jurisdictions are involved, which included Latah County Sheriff's Office, the Moscow Police Department, the Assateague County Sheriff's Office, the Clarkson Police Department, the Lewiston Police Department, and the Idaho State Police are all involved. And together, they're trying to figure out how they can get more information from David Stone. Maybe somehow they can get him to admit where the body is, if there is a body. So while Charles is currently incarcerated in the Taft Federal Prison in California, David would get a letter. This is what the police planned. And it was supposed to be from Charles within prison. And the letter would simply state, I need you to check on our friend. I think someone has disturbed her. They were hoping this would make David go to the body. So immediately after the letter is mailed, they place GPS tracking devices on all three of David's vehicles. And they watched and they waited and they tracked, but David did not go anywhere except his usual locations. However, one location that David drove to did lead them to their very next clue. It was the Moscow City Main and Center where David worked. Detectives decide to ask David's coworkers if anything seemed out of the ordinary about him in the weeks before or after Rachel went missing and the coworker comes forward and tells him that just a week prior to Rachel's disappearance, David just out of the blue wants to know how to operate a backhoe. So David told his coworkers he was gonna help a buddy with a project over the weekend. David's taught how to run a backhoe. What project is he referring to? Look at this thing. It doesn't exactly look like it's used to repair cars, does it? Burying a body? Definitely possible. David practiced with the backhoe. He dug a large hole in an area near the spoils pile. This is where the street sweepers dump all of their debris. David left this large gaping hole uncovered, even though he was instructed to fill it back in. David also made a statement to a coworker that he was angry with. He told that coworker if he didn't stop, he was going to bury them in the spoils pile. After that, David never, ever expressed any interest in the backhoe again. Not only that, another coworker has something even more incriminating to tell detectives. But it's not about Rachel. It's in regard to another woman who may still be in danger. Christopher Porter comes forward and alleges that in November or December of 2009, the same time that allegedly Charles had a physical fight with Rachel, remember that? He said that David asked him if he would kill his wife, Alyssa, for $10,000. Seriously? David informed Christopher that his wife, Alyssa Stone, had a very large life insurance policy. He also told Christopher that he would give him a nine millimeter gun to do it. Of course, Christopher says no. And then he tells him David reaches back out. And he says, you know what? Your services are no longer needed. Me and my buddy Charles, we came up with a plan to kill each other's wives. This cannot be real. Can you imagine a person just casually talking about this like it's an everyday thing? It's evil. It's absolutely sickening if it's true. A man like David, working as a volunteer firefighter, trying to save people's lives, but also allegedly planning to kill his own wife. So of course, detectives tell Lissa she may be next, and she decides to stay with her husband. He convinced her that the detectives and the police just made this story up to put pressure on him, hoping that he would turn against Charles. But David's not the only one talking. As expected, cool guy Charles Capone confided in an inmate that it was him that was making all those calls and those texts to Rachel pretending that he was being harassed as well, and that he was using that app to disguise his voice and his number. And I wanna tell you that this is an actual manipulation technique that is used by stalkers. They try to come to their victim's defense as heroes, but they're the one that should be feared. It's sick. And wait, because it gets more insane. This inmate builds rapport with Charles, but he's really turned into an informant. And he was instructed to ask Charles the best way to get rid of a body so it would never be found. Charles actually tells him how he would do it if he did kill someone. He says this saying he would put them on a tarp, then cut them up and dissolve the body in a car parts washer. Investigators say he had that parts washer in his Moscow shop. Wow, a tarp. Cut the body up and then use a car parts washer. The detectives pay Charles a visit and they blatantly say to him, Charles, today you're going to tell us that you killed Rachel and where her body is. And Charles answered with, well, you got one of those things, right? But I didn't kill her. 
So who did? Now they're putting pressure on David Stone, telling him, we know you have blood on your hands. All David says is, I think I need to get a glass of water, but he never denied it. But things like his phone records seem to speak for themselves. Between the hours of 8.40 p.m. on April 16th until 8.52 the morning after, that's the time between Rachel was last seen till the next day, 12 hours and 12 minutes are unaccounted for. No activity was on David's phone. And Charles had no activity between 7.30 p.m. on the 16th until 9.57 p.m. And Rachel's phone had no activity between 8.27 p.m. and 9.20 p.m. on the very same night. Very fishy. All three phones. All three phones have no activity between those times. It's a little bit weird with David's being off the longest. Three years had gone by. It was 2013. The police believe they have enough information and evidence to bring this case to the district attorney and charge both David and Charles with murder. The district attorney at that time is the very same one that's prosecuting the University of Idaho case against Brian Christopher Koberger. None other than Latah County Prosecutor Bill Thompson. And I am so happy to see this man's face. It's a familiar face to me now. The longtime Latah County prosecuting attorney received his Juris Doctor from the University of Idaho. He has strong ties to his community, especially when it comes to four students who were slain in his county who went to his alumni university. When presented with all the facts of Rachel's case, Here's what he had to say to the media. We felt it was time to proceed with charges. We're finally at the culmination of three years of investigation, three years of information gathering that put us in the position where we thought we had a sufficient basis to proceed and that it was time to move forward and try to get some closure, try to get some accountability. Now let's listen in on the prosecution's theory of what happened to Rachel and why. Court papers indicate Stone was also at the shop and lied to investigators to cover Capone's tracks. Investigators say the pair also talked about killing each other's wives. Here's the promise that Bill Thompson made to the public. We will absolutely continue searching for Rachel. Uh, that's one of the most important goals that we hope to have from this case. He promised he would continue to search for Rachel's body. But even without her body, they believed they had a very strong case, especially since after David was arrested, they got a sample of his DNA and it matched the DNA found on that same black latex glove tip they found in the Yukon. So all three, David's, Charles, and Rachel's DNA was on the tip of that glove. The probable cause affidavit in this case was very extensive. I know that the current one that's being talked about in the Idaho case has been said to be very detailed, but the one in Rachel's case was also very thorough. Even though there's only 12 pages in this one compared to the 18 page one that was recently released in reference to the arrest of Brian Koberger. But look at the one for Charles and David, page after page of evidence, all of which I've brought to you in this video. Even though the media stopped talking about Rachel's case, Detective Nichols never gave up the search for Rachel. Even on her days off, she would scour wheat fields wells, abandoned buildings, all looking for clues. She even consulted with psychics to use their visions and their dreams to try to locate Rachel. Amber even allowed a hypnotist to hypnotize her and tried to communicate with her mom so that maybe Rachel could tell her family where she was, but none of that worked. Something else wasn't going well. Remember the coworker of David Stone, Christopher Porter? Well, he would not appear in court. They subpoenaed him multiple times and he refused to testify about what David had allegedly told him about Charles and him planning to kill each other's wives. He told the detectives he knew nothing about the case. So now they only had circumstantial evidence to present to the jury and no body. But the prosecution still believed they had a strong case. At the preliminary hearing, all of this evidence was set up in detail with additional findings as well. Here are all the pieces of evidence they presented. Look at it all. This went on for several days. That's when Alyssa Stone finally became convinced that her husband David truly wanted her dead. It was devastating. She immediately filed for divorce, but David insisted he was not a monster. A motion from the defense was granted to seal documents in order for David and Charles to have a fair trial, and the same was asked in the Idaho case. A lot of what they wanted sealed actually pertained to the expenses going towards Charles's defense. DNA experts, investigators, it was an intense task. There were approximately 
3,800 pages of documents, 120,000 lines of cell phone records, 8,500 lines of GPS data, 30 hours of recorded interviews, 1,700 photos, and more, and it's costly. DNA tests per sample is $1,195 each, and the consultation fee for a DNA expert is $1,475 plus $295 per hour for testimony, and that's just one expert. One. The defense requested many experts, DNA experts, pharmaceutical experts, blood detection specialists, and here's what those experts' fees are. A blood detection expert is $1,200 just for the retainer to start. The scent dog expert was $3,000 for a retainer alone. Wow. I'm in school right now for death investigation, and I wonder how long before I can be an expert because it seems like it pays really well. They initially approved $30,000 for the defense experts, but requests can be made for an increase, and there were requests for increases. Trial date was set for December 2013, but just days before the trial was set to begin, David Stone wants to talk to detectives. His story is about to change. He wants a plea deal. If he agrees to tell them what really happened, he wants immunity for the murder charge, and they agree. It's a smart move because remember, they only have circumstantial evidence and it looks as though Charles is mounting an intense defense against these charges. David agrees to plead guilty to the charge of failure to notify law enforcement or the coroner of a death in exchange for his truthful testimony against Charles Capone. So what is it that David said really happened? Well, he said his decision to testify against Charles started when Charles whispered something in his ear during the preliminary hearing. And what was that exactly? David said Charles whispered, you shouldn't even be here. David decided he wasn't going to take the fall for Charles. His pastor was the one that ultimately convinced him to tell the truth. His version of that night was that he came over to help Charles work on his wife Alyssa's car, the Dodge Durango. While he was inside the garage, he heard a loud thud. He looked outside and he saw a struggle. He went towards the back of Rachel's vehicle, and that's when he saw Charles on top of her, strangling her, and Rachel was barely moving. David shouted, what the F are you doing? He said that Charles turned around and looked straight at him, and he had what he described as the look of Satan on his face, and he told David to shut the F up, to get a hold of himself, that he was in this with him now, and he knew where his family was. They asked him why he didn't intervene, and he said it was out of fear. He just saw a man kill his own wife. He didn't know what he was capable of doing to him. So he helped move Rachel's body inside of the shop. And then they brought the Yukon to the bus station close to Rachel's house and returned to the shop. Then they wrapped up Rachel's body in a tarp, laid her down over the chains, and then rolled her up in the chains. Then they placed her inside of the Dodge and they drove it out to a bridge over Snake River. Charles told him when to stop the vehicle. They got out, they opened up the back hatch, they pulled Rachel out, and they dumped her over the side. During the trial, the defense attorney's strategy was to discredit David Stone, create reasonable doubt about the state's evidence, and to offer alternate suspects. And one of those people was a name that we're familiar with from the beginning of the case, William Slem, the once obsessed boyfriend that wouldn't take no for an answer. Well, it turns out he's the perfect fall guy why? Because he was dead. He died before the case went to trial. Did he take secrets with him to his grave? Was he Rachel's real killer? The defense says so. They introduce evidence of a restraining order that Rachel filed against him, as well as testimony from Rachel's own daughter, Amber, saying that Rachel thought he was the one that vandalized her vehicle. The defense also called Detective Jackie Nichols to the stand to confirm that those letters William kept sending to Rachel did exist. But what the defense argued didn't exist was what the cops never found during their investigation. They attacked the lack of evidence of a crime. There was no physical evidence inside that repair shop, no signs of a struggle. There were no fingerprints of Charles in the Yukon, but there were a set of fingerprints that didn't match any known suspects. The defense cross-examined David for an entire day. One question they had was, if he wasn't your friend, and instead it was a guy who you thought was trying to harm you or you were fearful of, why did you guys still hang out? Why'd you stay in contact? Why were you acting like his buddy? 
His response was that he would rather know where the person was that may harm him for safety reasons. But the fact is, David Stone lied to police for three and a half years. So why should anyone trust him now? After seven days, Prosecutor Bill Thompson had the final word to the jury. He said, Rachel's gone forever. He ensured, pointing to Charles Capone, her body, her physical essence was also gone forever. But we can't let that allow him to escape responsibility. Essentially saying, just because he's good at hiding or getting rid of a body, don't let that be the reason he gets away with this. But Charles has always maintained his innocence, saying that he's done bad things in the past that he's not proud of, but killing Rachel isn't one of them. He doesn't have it in him. He's not a sociopath. He's just like most men. He just makes poor decisions. Okay, then. Rachel's loved ones had waited four and a half years to hear the verdict in this case, and it was time. They held their breath as they waited for the clerk to read off guilty or not guilty. And the verdict was guilty. Amber said it was a bittersweet moment. She wasn't getting her mother back. All it was doing was protecting other women and children from being harmed by Charles Capone. Rachel's family was allowed to give victim impact statements. Ashley, Rachel's other daughter said, we live in pain every day because what Charles did every one of us. Charles finally spoke when he declared he did not murder Rachel and the court had erred in convicting him. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, but he announced at the time that he intended to appeal immediately. There were a number of search operations that were conducted after David confessed to where they threw Rachel's body over the Snake River, but those searches have never turned up any sign of Rachel. As of July 2016, David Stone has actually been released on parole after serving just three years. Wow. The good news is Idaho's Supreme Court denied Charles Capone's request for a new trial in 2018. Also in 2018, prosecuting attorney Bill Thompson was interviewed by the Lewiston Tribune, Craig Clohesse, and he asked him, you've been the Latah County prosecutor for about 26 years. Is there a case that stands out for you? Bill Thompson said, We've had a number of remarkable, challenging cases. I think the one that probably currently stands out most is the Charles Capone murder trial, the murder of Rachel Anderson, where her body has never been recovered, but we were able to obtain a conviction, an appropriate conviction, and an appropriate sentence. I cried reading this. He said this four years before he knew what tragedy would befall Kaylee, Maddie, Ethan, and Zana in the fall of 2022. Now I think the one that probably stands out to him is the one that he has currently been tasked to undertake. And I honestly know that he's the right man for this job. To prosecute whoever is responsible for killing these four beautiful, talented, innocent, young University of Idaho students. I know that justice will be done. And I'm so sorry to Rachel's family and to the family of Kaylee and Maddie, Ethan, and Zana. This wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to happen to the people that you love, and I'm sorry. And I do want to thank all of you for being here today to listen to Rachel's story. And as usual, please leave your thoughts in the comments, but remember to always be kind. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.